That's it. I've waited long enough. Made too many versions of this video. I'm not doing that anymore. I mean business this time. We're going to talk about Jack Chalker's Exiles at Love Souls. I have glasses on. I have a suitably nerdy shirt on. And I have my notes right here that I'm going to read copiously. That's right. I'm going to read these notes. And you know I'm not going to stop. You don't, Maybe you don't know. I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to stop until I talked about this book and I don't have anything else to say. I don't know how long we're going to be here. You are not allowed to leave. Please. Jack Chalker, 1978, Exiles of the Will of Souls. This is a sequel to Midnight at the Will of Souls, which was written earlier. I can't remember if it was written the year before or whatever. I'll have the information on the screen because that's exactly, that's the kind of accuracy you need. You don't want to hear it from my voice. You want to be able to look at the screen there, one of those places, all these places perhaps, and we'll have that information there. That, now you know that information. I did a video on... Uh, Midnight at the Will of Souls. I liked it. That book is a high concept novel. The idea that there's a Markovian supercomputer, right? So let me, I guess I should talk about that because it's kind of a, although you don't have to have read that book to read this book. If you haven't read that book and you read this book, you kind of go, a what? Let me help you out a little bit. I'm going to help you out slightly spoiling the first one. Not exactly. Actually, I'm not going to, it's not really going to spoil it. I'm just going to tell you what happens. Oh, whatever. What happens in Midnight, which is somewhat pertinent to Exiles. In Midnight, you had a character who was sort of like, got trapped in the well world. The well world is this giant planet that is subdivided into all these hexes. And each hex is a different alien species, sort of. Uh, the hexes are organized in such a way that um, it kind of becomes improbable for one species to invade another hex, even though there's really no barrier usually, apart from just sort of like natural land formations. Sometimes there's no, no barrier. But it generally is like not suitable to really invade very much. There's sort of like a, a lot of thought was put into who goes where. The um, southern half of the planet at the, from the equator south is all like generally carbon based, like, like life forms similar to us, humanoid, I guess. Not always humanoid necessarily, but very similar. And the northern half is like really weird stuff. So anything in the northern half of the well world gets crazy, basically. In that book, Midnight at the Well of Souls, these characters find themselves on that planet and the Markovians had technology where they can sort of like do anything that they can think, make anything that they can think happen and be true and be true universally um, with the power of this computer. Oh, I guess the Markovians, Markovians are long extinct. And it's assumed that when they made this sort of technology that other beings who would get to this technology would be evolved enough that they would be cautious about using it. And Midnight, we get a bunch of characters who are seeking it out who are probably not deserving of that technology. They are not uh, intellectually and uh, I guess you would say uh, spiritually or whatever, um, evolved enough to take advantage of that computer, you know, to sort of utilize its abilities. And when I say that it can do anything, it's like, I'll give you an example from Exiles, because that's actually pertinent to the book that we're going to talk about. It is the book we're going to talk about, so that's why it's super pertinent. Um, at one point, the characters are the main character, Mavra Chang, is given a horse's tail. She's like transformed so that her body, she's normal, except that she has a tail of a horse. But anyone who's outside a certain area, which is like 80 meters or something along those lines, I can't remember the exact measurement, um, thinks that she's always had a tail and accepts that. Like it basically changes everyone's perception. So any change that happens by a Markovian computer doesn't just take place then. It isn't just like, oh, you're now you have a tail. It's like you've always had a tail and everyone you've grown up your whole life thinking you had a tail. And it's just sort of, it like rewrites the code of the universe, so to speak. <laughs> smaller changes mean smaller impact. Bigger changes have bigger impact and more risk. Okay. So that's the sort of problem that the Markovian computer can have. Now, in Exiles at the Well of Souls, we deal with Professor Zender. Professor Zender has, like, um, sort of, like, researched the Markovian technology and has sort of, like, figured it out. He's sort of like, okay, this. And so he's made a Markovian computer on a very small scale. It has a platform that something has to go onto, and he can make anything into anything else on that platform. Um, as long as they the, they can input enough data into the computer so it has a working knowledge of what something is and what something it's going to be. For example, I think they make 
Someone a centaur. I'm, you know what? Now I'm thinking about this. There's a lot of freaking centaurs in that book and in this book. I'm not really sure why. It, yeah. Anyways, I just, it just now just talking about it. I'm like, oh yeah, he made him into a centaur. It was like the first thing that happened in this book in Exiles is he turned somebody into a centaur. I'm like, okay. <laughs> not really sure why. A lot of centaur focus, right? Whew. Steamy centaurs. That was the difference. That was, uh, no, that was has been late. Never mind. Markovian computer can turn anything and go on the platform into anything else. Now, the problems can arise from if it's too much of a change, then it can break down, like, historically how that person would have, like, changed. Like, it would have changed them maybe mentally. And so there can be problems where that could cause, like, a butterfly effect, if for lack of a better example. And so that the supercomputer that Professor Zender has made who he is who has a name that has a name called Obi and Obi is um basically sentient um we'll get to that in a second Obi can like they can like input this data and he's like okay here's a human here's a data for a horse I'm gonna mix them and you know he can do that kind of stuff and that, that's something that can happen okay so that is the um beginning of the story is is that we have Professor Zender who's made who's figured out the Markovian this sort of technology in a sense on a very small scale and can do this thing and he realizes as he's making it that there's a real problem with this because you can also make someone like always think that this thing was a certain way so you could for example make somebody look a certain way and then everyone else will always think they look that way essentially rewriting their thoughts and he realizes that you can do this in other ways that would be extremely dangerous for example getting someone in power and changing them mentally to think that somebody else is that they'll just do whatever they want right and which could happen hmm professor zender works with ben euling euling is like an engineer i think that works with professor zender ben euling has ties to antor trelli who's a very powerful political figure and also uh, a kind of like just on the DL uh, sponge syndicate guy. So he gets people addicted to this really, really ugly drug that once you start on it, it's like you have to have it all the time or you it literally destroys your intellect. Antor Trellig is uh, one of the big bads in this series and so is Ben Euling. Sorry for the surprise. It's not much of a surprise. That happens pretty damn early. Trellig leans on Euling, Euling kind of pressures the professor. Antor Trellig wants uh, the professor to move the Obi project. The professor's not interested. They make him, I strong arm him, into moving the Obi computer to Antor Trellig's uh, like private pleasure planet. It's not supposed to be private, but it is uh, New Pompeii. Enter Ma Chang, our main character. She's like a pirate, a thief, and a spy. She's hired by someone who is supposed to go and to uh, to Antwerp Trellig's new Pompeii planet and see this new thing, this new thing he's going to show everybody, right? We as the reader know that this is Obi that he's trying to show off. So the woman does not know. So she hires Mavra Chang as like her emissary, like her stand-in to go and find out what's going on. She knows that the professor... Uh, Zender has been has gone there and it doesn't make much sense that he is she knows how bad a person Antor Trellig is so she sends Mavra in to get the professor and his daughter out of there and then find out what's going on I'm, I'm almost positive that this person does not know what's actually going on there neither does Mavra well Mavra doesn't know so yeah <laughs> sound a little un sound like a little uncertain I'm not uncertain at all I know exactly what happened I read that book I read the book twice there so I must know I want to say that um, a, like a, quick, a real quick note here is that you know there's a large cast of characters in this book there really is and I am surprised that with this large cast of characters you don't ever get lost in them a lot of the times you get books that just keep introducing new characters and you're like oh man who is this I just didn't have a problem with it I just didn't I mean that's it's I don't know if it's their naming scheme is different enough or I think it's just that you're introduced to them and you get a little bit with them every time so you really kind of like it solidifies their personality and they're and they're well handled and Chalker just seems to do that very well that's something I really like about him is he can introduce a lot of characters and you just don't get lost in them the characters are always um, important to one extent or another but you just don't get lost with them you know like I have seen with other books where it just keeps putting new people in you're like who the hell is this I don't know who this guy is so I like that I appreciated it I enjoyed it the last thing to kind of mention in this sort of like brief like overview is that Obi 
is a supercomputer which is semi-sentient or perhaps it is sentient and Obi has other plans the uh, Antor wants to obviously weaponize to one extent or another this Markovian computer Obi and Obi is not particularly excited about that and actually you get that impression very early on that Obi is not particularly excited about um, the machinations of Ben Euling and is an Antor Trellig himself. I don't think I'm stretching anything too much or spoiling anything too much in that I say that these characters end up at the well world at some point, which is a um, so distant from human space as to be like insane, right? You know, we're talking galaxies and galaxies away, and I don't think that there's uh, quite that level of space travel. So the well world is like not a known location. The way that people generally get there is to a well gate. What's a well gate? My goodness, I got into all this. A well gate is sort of like this invisible portal that was left there that if you're in the right mental state and you're in the right place at the right time, it will transport you in and dump you into the well world. And if that happens to you, then you're made to go through a well gate. And if you go through a well gate, which you basically have to do when you show up on this planet, the computer, this Markovian supercomputer on the, the well world itself, which is a giant supercomputer, uh, the well world looks at you and picks one of these 6,000 something individual hexes where all these different alien species live and it drops you in one and you become whatever that thing that thing is. Uh, for example, in the last book, someone becomes like this sort of like tree-like creature. Someone becomes a centaur, yes. Someone becomes, uh, what else do we have? Uh, somebody becomes a mermaid, I think. Kind of like a yeah like a mermaid yeah that's right yeah they do so strange as in the last book uh then midnight so some strange stuff happens so that's kind of like what has to happen like when you go there that you're supposed to go through the well gate that like reprocesses you you alchemate yourself to that new body and the new society that you're part of and the new mental state and all this other stuff and you get become part of that world that's a brief overview highlights uh, the first one is definitely Mavra Chang herself, a really great protagonist. She's always moving the story forward. She gets caught in these difficult situations, and she doesn't uh, muscle her way out, and she doesn't just like instantly outthink everybody. She's definitely an intelligent person who's very good at strategy. She just sort of like, like diligently does her best, and it's she's very competent, but she's not infallible, and so you get this really great action character and the other thing is she's not a like a female uh character skin over a male character if you know what i mean you know sometimes we'll just take a male like very action oriented character and we'll just make that character female just change all the he's to she's mavra isn't written that way just a really good character a really exciting character. i mean in fact anytime the camera is away from mavra once she's introduced you're kind of like we need to get back to mavra the scene with mavra where she's doing like some spy stuff when she goes to new pompeii those are some of the some of the best scenes i think of the book really good tension i you know i just wish that we'd gotten a little more of it it was we we got a decent amount i just wished i'd gotten more of that but just a lot of fun in general to see Mavra sort of get out of situations and specifically those spy scenes, these sort of sneaking around thiefish type scenes that we have with Mavra on New Pompeii, I liked. They were good. And then the next thing that's really great, or I guess you could say is great, is Ben Euling and Antor Trellig are villains that you love to hate. Man, oh man. These guys, it doesn't take very long for you to realize that like they're both very conniving and nasty and you and you kind of get a little apprehensive anytime they get close to a character you like. You're like, man, these guys are so devious. They're going to do something terrible. Um, there's some especially good scenes with them that feature them where you really, really dislike them. You're like, man, I hate these guys. <laughs> you know. And the, and the thing is that they're not only that they're um, they're also very intelligent. And so you kind of get like a little like mm, confounded or kind of uh, irritated because you're like their, their plans or their uh, their scheming is so far thinking ahead. They're, they're intelligent enough that they can plan far enough ahead that it's really difficult for someone to get a one-up on them. The upside of that is that they're always also sort of looking at each other and waiting for the other one to sort of knife them in the back. Uh, there's some great scenes there with those two kind of like looking at each other saying, what are you going to do something I don't like? Oh, I don't trust you. Like the previous book, you get a lot of different alien cultures and variety. Chakra is a really great skill at sort of Introducing something new and interesting, giving you the highlights, keeping you interested, and moving the story along. Knows how to strike a very good balance there. And just like in 
Midnight Chocolate does a great job, just an excellent job of like when a character goes through a well gate and they find themselves transformed for like sort of like describing that transformation and or or at least that character sort of coming to terms with it like discovering who they are what they look like how they are how they function how they think differently how the society they just got reborn into uh functions and how what that means to them and how the, in, in some cases for example like antor trelli how they can exploit it and for other characters sort of like how maybe even here they're a bit of an outsider he is a very good streamlined version it has a bit well the whole book has a has a tinge of 70s sci-fi i think it goes without saying that if you're going to read any of these barlow's books especially some of them this is one a little bit that you're going to have to kind of like science fiction from the 70s if you don't it might be a hard bill to swallow that should probably be in a different section i put it here anyways because i knew you couldn't wait and that's i guess i've used that joke twice and i don't care so the low lights for this story um any time that the camera turned away from Mavra and followed one of the other characters, I found almost all of them less compelling. Even the ones that were, even like Antor and Ben Euling, who were not great, I just did not find them as interesting as Mavra. I just really was like, okay, this is fine. I will be glad when we can get back to Mavra. Those other characters, their sections are written well, and their story moves well. It's just that I found Mavra to be such a, uh, I don't want to say electrifying, because that makes it seem like she was always doing something crazy and dynamic. It's just she's just kind of like always advancing the story, always moving forward, it seems like. And so there's times when the camera's away from her, and there's also times where it feels like she's a little bit sidelined because of uh, uh, whatever, other events, I guess you could say that I wasn't real happy about. I just was kind of like, we need to get Mavra back to where she can do stuff because it's fun when she, do, when she does stuff, you get interested. At least I did. So um, I'm going to say you will too because uh, I think that, yeah, yeah, sure. We, you know, we got a thing, you and me. So we're probably the same way. Some of the aliens here are really just this sort of like 70s reimagining of fantastical creatures from myth as science fiction creatures. Um... In the last book, centaurs were one of them. In this book, you get like a um, minotaur. Uh, and I think there's a, something else too. It's just not occurring to me. I'm okay with those. I think that was a real novel idea in the 70s. Like, oh, like we're going to take this like creature from myth and we're going to like imagine it in like today's, like what if it was a science fiction creature? How would it really work? Or like what would its society be like? And the the idea of that sounds cool. I don't know. As like it probably was in the 70s. It's, it seems like it's a very novel idea that it doesn't hold as much water as it used to. Uh, at least for me. Maybe if somebody new to it will think it's neat. I just uh, I just think that it's okay. It's all right. You know, I would rather that we didn't do as much of that. But oh well. I would have rather. I in fact I enjoyed Chakra's more exotic science fictiony uh, creature sort of whole cloth imaginings than I enjoyed the uh, fantastical creatures that he creates uh, sort of like writes up a, like a science fiction explanation for like for example a minotaur like you know it sort of takes the idea of a minotaur and sort of like puts a society around it it's okay and in fact the minotaur society itself is kind of like uh, i'm gonna say the word cringe yeah that's probably accurate i'm not crazy about using the word but it's not totally inaccurate so it's cool that i used it and the last thing, the kind of a low light thing to remember, is that this is only half a story. It does end on a beat, so it's good. It's not a bad ending. But if you read this book, you need to kind of understand that you're going to need to kind of commit yourself to reading the sequel to this book, the third book in the installment, which is a uh, Quest for the Will of Souls. There's some stuff in Quest that's great. It's just, as a whole, I don't think it quite matches this book. So the touchstones, the moments in this book that I found to be particularly memorable, uh, one would be Mavra sort of doing her spy stuff on New Pompeii. Those were some great scenes. Maybe the, my favorite scenes in the whole book. I don't know, maybe it's probably a, a, an underpowered word. Definitely my favorite scenes in the whole book. I thought that was really cool. I wished we had had almost a whole book of Mavra doing cool stuff like that. I don't know if... Um, if after the after quest if it continues to follow Mavra or not I just don't know um if it did then I would probably be interested in reading it even if it didn't I think I would probably want to read it I, I ended up really enjoying the series so I, the Mavra stuff though her doing spy stuff and figuring stuff out I liked it was never a uh 
like what's the uh, what's the word she, she, she's never a uh, like a mary sue or whatever right i hate that i don't really like that word because i think it gets thrown around inappropriately a lot but uh she's never anything like that um what she definitely is is a very competent character who has a really good um eye for figuring out how to get out of a situation or how to resolve a situation or how to move forward and that makes her a very interesting and dynamic character so that scene with her being spy stuff great stuff loved it and there's a scene on New Pompeii with Antor Trellig and Ben Euling when they're uh, sort of like trapped. I don't want to give away too much here. When they're sort of trapped and they have to sort of like connive or like scheme their way out. Trying to get one over on some people. Trying to not let the other one get one over on the, on them. Not let Ben is, not, is trying not to let Antor get one over on him. And Antor not let Ben get one over on him. And they're just kind of like really scheming characters. And you're kind of like, oh my gosh. It's a very memorable scene. You really don't like those characters through that scene. You, other people don't realize how, um, or don't uh, don't really understand how uh, uh, sharp and intelligent they are. And how they kind of like use that sort of like, oh, certainly somebody wouldn't do this. And they use that sort of attitude to their advantage and really, really uh, make people pay if they underestimate them, which it seems like a lot of people do. Analogs to this book, the uh, other books or stories that are similar to this. One way I would say is maybe like um, some other alien superstructure books like Ringworld. That's that's not too different. Uh, there's there's definitely similarities between Ringworld in a sense and the kind of stuff that happens in Ringworld and this book. Ringworld, and I've just recently reread it, it's very like it's mu very much a marriage of sort of like older like pulp stories like uh, um, you know kind of like Sword and Planet almost like uh, uh, John Carter of Mars and more like traditional hard sci-fi. It's kind of like a kind of like a blend of those two things. Ringworld has a, a sense of being very um, kind of archaic in its uh, ideologies and its thoughts. Like uh, like it's um, even though written in similar time periods, it has a sense of being like. Mm, kind of outdated ideas about things. I'm going to leave it at that. Whereas a uh, well world feels a lot more progressive in a sense. It feels like, I think that it's aged a whole lot better than ring world has. And I think the, the, the chalker in, in general, and in the, in the three books I've read of him always seems to be, his stuff seems to be slightly progressive. I don't really know his stance on a lot of issues, honestly, but the way that he talks about things and the time that he takes to, to not say certain things, make me wonder possibly although this seems a seems like a stretch when i thought of it but it's more of a stretch now than when i thought of it which is a uh, china melville's perdido street station and the reason i mentioned that one is because of sort of like all these bizarre sort of um uh, kind of like uncomplimentary cultures existing in very close space to one another and that's what perdido street station is very much like and this book is very much like that different like little like countries almost of like alien species all right next to each other and interacting with each other and weird things happen uh, so you get a very diverse and interesting cast that way and so it kind of reminds me in a sense of that and then the other thing is if you've read other 70s science fiction i think this is this is very much in line with that stuff i think it's probably a really good example of a 70s science fiction series that's probably kind of on the off most off the radar i don't i mean this stuff is still in print but it's just kind of surprising that i don't know much about chalker and this is actually pretty decent stuff i see a lot of people say that they would read this book this series and they went back and thought oh it wasn't as good and i'm like actually when i read i read this book in particular twice because i read it once was going to do a video did a bunch of videos like three or four and didn't do anything with them so i read it again because it's been too because uh, then i was starting to like base a review or a video on an old video and i'm like that's not gonna work so i read it again and i really enjoyed it even more on a second read and i saw a lot of qualities in the writing that i really liked so for a rating i think that i would give this book a seven out of a ten it has a uh, good pacing moves quickly engaging um, somehow it managed to have all this these cast of characters a wide cast of characters very diverse settings a lot of different stuff going on and you know you would think that that would lead you to sort of get uh, lost in all of that but you don't what's great about it is that uh, chalker's writing style just sort of like smooths all those edges away and you just get to kick back and relax and just enjoy a really well-written story a real a well-written story that just a well-written story that you just uh, really end up enjoying and you just sort of think man what a cool i kind of thought of the first book like uh, Midnight is being like a romp. And there's a little bit of that in that book, I guess. I don't know if that's entirely true. I think it's I think it's not quite as much that. I think it's just that 
Chonka writes um, in a very forward moving narrative. He doesn't spend too much time sort of, you know, getting into somebody's head and really, really dragging it out. It just kind of the story moves forward. And so a lot happens in this book. A lot happened in the last book. A considerable amount happens. Something that can sometimes happen in especially science fiction in this area is that you can get, um, especially hard science fiction or stuff that leans a little bit towards that, is you get so much science that it just slows the story way down. And that makes it a little bit more, a little less accessible for someone, for everyone, right? Science fiction of this time sort of assumes uh, this is a characteristic of science fiction from the 70s. It sort of assumes that you like science and math or that you're kind of into it. It sort of assumes that. I mean, I think that you're going to find that to be a pretty common denominator in a lot of uh, science fiction of the era. I don't think that that's a, a conceit that you get necessarily in science fiction nowadays. There it is. Jack Chalker's Exiles of the Little Souls. I enjoyed the book. It's a good book. I think I like this. I, I think I like this sequel. I like the sequel too. I just like this book a little bit more. Now let's talk about the Barlow's entry, right? Barlow chose the Uchjin from this story, which are described in the book as being paint smears. I'll put the image of the Uchjin from Barlow's Guide up on the screen. It's a very unusual choice. It is a very weird alien. I think it's weird because you don't see a lot of the Uchjin. I mean, they have low, low, low screen time in this book and so i when i like i when i read the book i didn't i knew that this was in here i knew that exiles for the love souls was one of the books featured in here i thought okay cool and i didn't look at the picture and then when i was done i'm like let's find that which one was and i find it and, I, and then i looked at the picture and i thought what <laughs> wait what where were where were these guys at oh that was them okay well, how was that seem bigger than I thought? And I like fast forwarded to it. I'm like, mm, no, it wasn't. It was pretty small. <laughs> so I think it's a strange choice. I'm not really sure. Maybe Barlow chose this because he was at the end of this book and it's like, I want something easy. <laughs> this is an easy one to paint, right? Sure. Just a couple of little lines and some shading. We're good. I don't know. That's probably not true, but <laughs> I thought it was strange. I do like that there's this little detail, I'll show this too, where it says a side view of the mysterious Uchjin. Yes, they're very mysterious, and also not a whole lot to show. It's just a green line that gets fat at one end. So, yeah, the Uchjin. Here, let me read the, uh, I'll read the entry for the Uchjin to you, so that you can enjoy these words. Uh, the Uchjin is an intelligent, non-carbon-based entity shaped like an extremely pliable smear of matter, about one meter wide and two meters long. Individual Uchjin range in color through the entire visible spectrum, but each of them is only one color. The Uchjin are, is able to float freely in three dimensions and move very quickly as its thick leading edge thins and contracts in any given direction. The Uchjin live underground during daylight hours, issuing from cracks on the ground at night. They are nearly invisible in twilight, becoming progressively brighter as darkness falls. And this is habitat. The Uchjin live in an atmosphere that is mostly helium. They are completely non-technological, te technological, sorry about that, Unable to make use of the simplest devices, nothing more is known about these elusive and unusual beings. We don't know anything else about them. This is just strange choice. Uh, it was. I think there was another. There was another uh, alien in that book that was probably a little bit better choice. This is a little more unusual, which is probably considering the way that that alien looked, how it might have looked like another one of the aliens in this Barlow's guide. I guess that's why they chose the Ujjin. It just seems weird. I'm going to have to guess that two books out of this uh, Chalker series, that, they, that either uh, Barlow or the um, the guy who co-wrote this with him, who is uh, Ian Summer, Summers or Beth, but I think Beth Meckham, 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 Ooh, I don't know. I said it right, just remember that, whichever way I said it. Uh, I think Beth, Beth was the editor, but I could be wrong. I guess one of them had, I don't know, anyway, it could have been Barlow, what do I know? Um... Must have been into this to pick two because it's kind of like a strange choice. Although then, or I, like I said, maybe they were just like, you know what? I'm not feeling like doing a whole lot today. Let's do let's do the Ushjin. You know, I just got to draw like this little swirly, like this sort of. That's all we got to do. And they're like, yeah, that's cool. You can get a green pen. Yeah, I'm done. I like Barlow stuff a lot. This is an unusual. It's hard to get excited about this drawing. 
but I'm trying to give it everything I got, which is uh, not a lot. I'm going to say that I did not spend a lot of time on this illustration when I got this book, and it doesn't give you a lot of reasons to spend your time in there because it doesn't tell you anything other than just like, yep, they can change colors, they can stretch out, and they come from the rocks. Ooch, Jin. There you are. Bam. <laughs> Be amazed. <laughs> tell your kids. Tell your grandkids. I don't know. Tell your grandpa. I, whatever you, tell your mom. I don't care. Or your dad. You can tell anybody. You can tell your friends. No secrets. Well, thanks. This has been Literally Books' production of <laughs> Chalk Jack Chalkers, Exile at the Will of Souls. Thanks for spending your time here. You can do YouTube things. There, I think they go, uh, let's see, this hand, yeah, over here. It's over that way, I think. I'm pretty sure it's over there. But if you decide you want to do it, they're over there. You can do that. It makes me feel good. I don't know. Uh, sure. Yeah, it, makes, it actually is kind of cool. So I do appreciate when you do it. And if I entertained you, and I hope that I have, then uh, this is a way to say thanks, and I appreciate it. And if you're interested in this book, I'm going to put it in the description. I actually try to always do that with a few, few, few exceptions. I try to always do that. You can pick up the book. It's an Amazon link. I mean, if you don't like Amazon, I'm sorry. I don't really have any other resource for you. But if you buy stuff from Amazon, and a lot of us do, that's a way to get this book. And it, I don't know, it makes it like... um gets me a little closer to the being in the black as it were as far as this stuff goes <laughs> you know it's a paid link i guess i should say that yes i get paid you know i get uh jeff bezos to personally write me a check it's very nice of him i appreciate it he never signs them the way i would hope he doesn't sign them love jeff ever ever thanks for watching this again i'm saying that again because i want to say thanks again because i like to say thank you and i'm out Oh, thank God.